welcome everyone to the 12 o'clock session. This particular session um, was born at least in part out of my incredible love for product. I just cannot get enough language learning products. And um, for, for this conference, we picked um, representatives, uh, for this session, we picked representatives of publishers that really um, cover a huge spectrum of languages because you guys like languages. And while we like the standard ones that you can find easily in bookstores all over the place, in the United States, for example, there are a lot of languages that are of interest to you that go beyond what you might be able to find in your local bookstore. So um, I'm going to pass it over now to four, publish four um, publishing representatives. Um, you're, they're each going to speak for seven to eight minutes. I know that's sort of an odd number, but that's how the math worked out. And then uh, we're going to take question and questions um, from the audience audience for them. So we are going to start first with Sarah Cole on the right here from Teach Yourself. And we also have next to, uh, we have next to her, sorry, <laughs> I have these out of order, um, Sam Valenoia of Rutledge. Next to her we have, um, so the second from the left, we have Priti Chitnis Gress of Hippocrini Books. And then on the far end, we have the male member of our panel. <laughs> Nicholas Ragano of Asimil. So I hope you enjoy um, hearing about some of your favorite products, the inside secrets to what will befall us in the future. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? It is um, a great honor to be here presenting in front of you and, and quite humbling. I'm actually only bilingual. Sorry about that. Um, and it's, it's really, truly inspirational because um, it's not often I find myself in the company of so many other language nerds. So, <laughs> OK, so I'm going to speak quickly because as you've heard, I only have seven minutes. Um, what's going on in the publishing market? I'm going to try and give you as much insight as possible without giving away all my secrets to my competitors over here. Um, so this shocking graph displays the total consumer market for language learning books in the United Kingdom. As you can see, there's been a sharp decline um, starting in about 2008, 2009. And so from 2005 to 2014, it's basically been cut in half, 1.6 million to 857,000. Some people might say this is because British people have stopped um, wanting to learn languages or have uh, decreased their interest, but actually, I think there's been some disruption in our language learning market because I should point out this is book sales only and through Amazon. So nowadays, the publisher is not only competing with other publishers. They are competing with a host of different kind of people entering the language learning field. So you have your startups um, that are based on technology, online tutoring services, massive open online courses, which are all free. Universities are now creating their own courses online. Social platforms. Skype, even, is presenting a challenge to the language learning market. YouTube, of course, that's where people go now. Um, app developers who have amazing platforms to create amazing, interesting, and innovative apps. Um, and even bloggers nowadays are selling their courses. I see Benny Lewis sitting in front of me. The Irish polyglot. Many of you know him. So what um, this digital innovation has really allowed for the learning market to change <clears throat> and is now providing new, what I call, learning experiences. So it's no longer about just getting your book and sitting on your own. Um, learner expectations are really dictated by what else is going out there in the market. So, you know, Nike.com, you can create your own sneakers and design them. Apple has obviously changed the way we interact with technology, um, Instagram, even the New York Times. And so when people come to learning, they're going to have the same expectations as they have in the rest of the digital sphere. So they still want things in language courses, and when I say they, I mean you. Um, they want reliability. They want sound pedagogy, um, good authors, for the material to be standards-based. They want books. They want online. But more and more, I think learners of languages want a personalized learning journey. 
They want the content to adapt to what their needs are. They want gamification to stay motivated. Um, they want a flawless user experience. Edutainment, that's why people go to YouTube. Um, augmented reality, things like this. So there's a huge evolu um, evolution in learning. And I think it's fantastic because it means that we can make language learning more fun and more effective. Um, and I think also it means that language learning can become part of our daily lives because there is no longer this divide between learning and the rest of what we do every day. It's somewhat integrated. So traditional publishers need to be able to respond to this and harness the development, developments in technology to enhance the learning experience. So if you just look at the simple search engine, nowadays if you go on your mobile device and you search the word French, Swahili, an app appears first. So for us to have a presence there and stay on top, literally, in the search engine, we need to have apps. Um, the, number, the numbers for online language learning are staggering and really reassuring at the same time from a personal's perspective. Um, Babbel has 1,300 new users an hour, they say. Um, Duolingo has 100 million users, 8 million of whom are active. And Busu uh, has 55 million users. And what these companies have done is they have really innovated the way that they do their consumer marketing. I think they're brilliant at it. Um, and they're innovating in terms, again, of the user experience. They're using gamification and social networking to make language learning fun. And, um, and again, it's also very convenient, so it fits in with their lifestyle. The online language learning market is supposed to grow in the next four to five years by over 10%. So this is definitely an area that we need to get into. The role of the traditional publisher today, um, I like to think of it a bit of the hare and the tortoise. Um, we still have relevancy, of course, and I think that is to promote and inspire language learning. Uh, we have access to the media. We have distribution worldwide, marketing, things like that. And there are a lot of developers out there who want our content. So it's important that we get the message out and we inspire people to learn languages. Research and development is integral to what we do. We are focused on quality control, um, and we are very process driven, which makes us slow to market, but hopefully the end result is really good. We work with academics, we work with language institutions around the world, and it's a collaboration when we publish something. So all of that knowledge is feeding back. All of the new methodologies and pedagogies are feeding back into what we do. Um, it's important that we test and pilot every book that we create, um, or any new product, really. And when we innovate, it has to be for the purpose of learning, not just to innovate for the sake of having a cool thing, but how does it enhance learning? So take the time to think about that, because we are not technology companies, but we need to stay abreast of technology. Consumer insight is important to what we do. Um, we need feedback from people like you. And we need to make sure that all of our courses are correlated to standards so that learning is meaningful. People know what level they're learning um, and what their outcomes are. So specifically to teach yourself, um, this is a, our sort of timeline. It was founded in 1938. Uh, one of, it came out of the wartime efforts to help people and help Britain win the war. One of the most popular courses, anecdotally, is um, learn, teach yourself how to fly which is somewhat of a frightening idea, but actually, um, all of the pilots um, really use this book. So the Spitfires were, were flown by that, um, people who learned from that book. It wasn't until 1939 that the first language courses came out, and then nothing really changed until the 1970s when we added audio to our courses. And then again, nothing really changed until 2010 when we published our first flat ebook, so just print ebook. And then a year later, we added audio to that. In 2012, we published our first apps. Um, in 2013 14, it's not listed here, but we had our first video course and video streaming online with Chinese with Mike. And now, this year, 2015, we've released our beta site of Teach Yourself Languages Online. So again, it's slow and then really exponential um, changes in order to react to what's going on in the market. Um, we're not supposed to do marketing here, but I will say that <laughs> this is a beta site. Um, 
and we released it in hopes of getting feedback and piloting. So again, we get this feedback to lead us into how to innovate and how to make it better. Um, everybody at this conference gets six uh, months free trial. If you go to our booth, there's a card. And I'm inviting you to please feedback um, because we do want to make this an amazing learning experience. And I think my time is up, so thank you. So, hello. <laughs> I'm the editor of Language Learning at Routledge. Uh, we've been publishing language learning books, focusing on the less commonly taught languages in particular, since the early 70s. Our first Chinese course, our colloquial Chinese, the original colloquial Chinese, published in 1982. And I wanted to mention this one today because it's, it's got a bit of an interesting story. This 1982 book is still in print today. We still publish it, we still sell it. And it's one of our top sellers still. And you can imagine how dated the content is, um, how old fashioned, there's references to comrades and communes, and you can, you can imagine it's, it's pretty dated. And I mean, there are no illustrations, uh, the, there's no text design to speak of, it looks like it's been written on a, on a typewriter, which it probably was. But um, this, is an, this is a nice reminder to us that actually the focus, although there are a lot of changes going on in the publishing industry, our focus is always and always has been and always will be on, on producing quality materials that will help people learn the languages they choose to learn and will hopefully be useful for, for many years to come. Uh, so, so yeah, that's our original Chinese course, still in print. The series has grown considerably since then. We, we published in 77 languages now and we're still adding to that. And our, our heart lies in, in the less commonly taught languages still very much. And we are, we are moving with the time. So <laughs> our, our latest edition has been this uh, dedicated portal for the series. We have decided to move all our audio online. And it is freely accessible, available to everyone, anyone. You don't have to buy the book. You don't need a password. You don't need to register any language you're interested in. You can just go onto our site, listen to the any any of these languages, 77 languages. And I'll just show you uh, a quick take a quick tour through the site. So this is the home page. And then we have this interactive map. So you can take a look. So the, so the countries that are highlighted in green, we have a course, a language course for that for that country. So whatever you're interested in, you can click through, read a little bit about the book, buy the book obviously, and then you've got the audio there. Um, to stream or download, and, and it's accessible across devices on uh, laptops or phones or your PC. And this is something that we're hoping to, to add on over the years. Obviously, the digital environment's becoming more and more important, and at the moment we're blending print. We're finding print still quite resilient, so we're blending print and, and online, so every book now has a companion website, and where where things are, are better off online, such as audio that you might want to listen to on the go, then that's, that's online. And we're going to build on this. So over time, we'll be adding interactive exercises and flashcards for vocabulary and so on and so forth. And we're, we're also very interested in feedback on, on what people would like to go online as opposed to in print. And then looking ahead, um, apart from the colloquial series, we do do a whole range of other languages and other text types and other products. So we really, the colloquial series obviously is for beginners, but we, we like to focus on intermediate and higher levels in the less commonly taught languages because there are still a few resources in these areas. So, so we like to focus on these. We've got our comprehensive grammar series for those people who are really advanced in their learning. We have a, a Burmese coming out next year, a Punjabi, a Kazakh. Um, we're also publishing for in interpreters and translators, more advanced level readers. We have an Arabic reader, we have a, a Yiddish reader coming out next year as well. And our frequency dictionary series as well, which has been really popular, the 5,000 most commonly uh, used, used words in, in any given language. So it's a good way to focus your vocabulary learning. Um, so we have uh, Persian coming out next year and Turkish as well, and Korean to add to the series. 
And then finally, this is my email address. So if anybody has any, any books that they really want to see published, any language that we've been ignoring or we haven't thought of, please do get in touch and let us know what you'd like to see published, what you'd like, what you need. So that's it from me. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want the clicker over here? Turned on? Oh, OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm from Hippocrene Books. My name is Preeti Grass. And uh, we're a publisher that focuses also on the lesser known, lesser taught languages of the world. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about our company, um, Hippocrene, the name itself, it many, maybe you already know, it's the fountain of the muses in Greek mythology. Um, we're an independent publishing company, so we're not part of a, a larger media group or anything like that. Um, the company was founded about 40 years ago by George Blagavidoff. And sadly, George, George passed away last year, but um, it's still owned by his family. George was born in Poland, and um, his family is of Russian background. He grew up during, um, before he was a teenager during World War II in Poland. And um, I think that all of, all of his experiences during the war really influenced him to, um, you know, his career path in general. He, uh, his family eventually ended up in a displaced persons camp in Germany. He ended up studying in Antwerp. So he picked up English and German and French and so forth, and he ended up um, a true polyglot. He knew seven languages very well. And he came to America eventually, and uh, he worked in bigger publishing houses like Macmillan and Doubleday. But um, eventually, he decided to start his own company. And Hippocrene began by distributing um, books from other publishers, primarily Langenscheid, um, the German dictionary publisher. And we found uh, back then, George found, that there was a need for other languages. There, were, there was a demand for more than what was out there. And so that's really where he started publishing um, books on his own. The first dictionary published was a Polish dictionary. He called upon a, a friend from his university days. And the list kind of just grew from there. And the idea is that we're filling a niche, um, really focusing on the lesser known and lesser taught languages of the world. And that same philosophy drives the program now. Yes, we do have some French and Spanish, German, that type of offerings. But we also have Marathi or Khmer or even um, a product in Bogotu, which is a language of the Solomon Islands. Um, so incidentally, I'll just pause for a second and mention that we also publish international cookbooks. That's another focus of ours. And it kind of, um, it, it kind of you know, followed naturally from the language program. And our cookbooks also are definitely off the beaten track. Um, we won't just have an Indian cookbook. It'll be the cuisine of Kerala, or an, not an Italian cookbook, but like a Ligurian cookbook. Um, so it, it's, you know, they kind of go hand in hand. People have to speak. They also have to eat around the world. And um, we, we're trying to, to fill both those needs. Um, so as, as far as languages go, though, our, our three basic series are the beginner's guides. Um, they have an audio component, usually two CDs. And um, our most popular languages are Arabic, Chinese, and even Icelandic is one of our top selling beginner's guides. Um, and a few of our beginner's guides also now have an interactive online component, um, which you know we're speaking to the, the importance of growing in that area. It's, it's certainly true. Um, we also have practical dictionaries. So not just language self-study guides, but we also offer dictionaries in a host of languages. Um, the practical dictionary series, the dictionaries have about 15,000 to 30,000 entries. And um, they're portable, they're paperback, affordable, good for travelers and students. And um, you know some of our best-selling languages there are like uh, Arabic, Dari, Tagalog, and and of course we have dictionary and phrase books, which we have loads of those. Those are for travelers. Um, they're they're slim and easy, half phrase book, half dictionary. And the most popular language we're selling in that area is Haitian Creole. Um, so to talk about Hippocrene's current role in the market. Um, I, our books are used a lot by schools, universities, and individuals. 
And um, talking about schools, they're used often in ESL and ELL programs, as well as world language programs. Um, ESL students require a print book sometimes to have on hand while they're testing or while they're um, in class, and the teachers in those classes often also don't know the native language of their students. So um, we're seeing you know, a great need, especially in New York City schools and other larger school systems, where people are using these products um, for their ESL programs, Uzbek, Bengali, things like that that um, are hard to find in other places. And so, you know, what are, Ellen asked us to speak about what's the benefit of uh, publishing in today's market. I, I think can sort of be encapsulated in the world word globalization. It's it's rampant. It's <laughs> ongoing, and people are migrating from place to place, and they are learning, um, like you all are, learning languages, um, learning to communicate, and in, also in our our post 9/11 world, there's there's a new demand for different languages, and I think. Um, the, not just Arabic now, um, we provide languages like Farsi and Urdu and Pashto. We get a lot of um, interest from government and military as well to, you know, for our products. Um, so there's that. And demand and need, I think, for certain languages can change very suddenly. Um, for, la for a few years ago, um, we saw the earthquake in Haiti. We couldn't keep our Haitian Creole dictionary in stock fast enough, um, relief workers and aid uh, agencies were using it. And interestingly, last year, uh, during the Ebola crisis in Sierra Leone, we were one of the, possibly the only people who have a Creole dictionary, which is the language spoken in Sierra Leone. So that, again, um, was a need that you know we could fill. Um, it's very challenging to keep up. And um, sometimes we might have a product ready on hand and available when uh, you know, pestilence or <laughs> warfare or something like that happens. Um, and sometimes uh, we don't. So it, it's hard to like predict these things, but you kind of see like the, the path, um, you, you wanna find qualified authors and, and find, uh, and build good products with them, but it takes time. I think we've all talked about that's, that's the drawback in publishing, like nothing's super instant. You need to have um, time to edit and copy edit and have foreign language readers go through it. And um, so we try our best uh, <laughs> to have those products available. It takes usually a year, to, though, to publish a book, and that's pretty quick. Um, and OK, to address technologies, um, Yes, the market is changing, and ebooks are, are certainly in heavy use, and other kind of products too for language learning. Um, but we've also found the print book is is important for us. I mentioned the schools that are using them, and um, some e-readers don't even support the foreign scripts that you know some of our dictionaries are in. So that's a drawback. I'm sure over time, you know, they're they're able to support more and more characters and languages, but. Um, Sometimes the print book is all you have, especially like Vigor or Khmer. You know, we're looking. Th this is what we have for you, and this it's, it's a book. <laughs> so, um, but but that said, I will say that we are the area we're growing in is this um, interactive website that goes along with some of our beginners' books, and that's an area we we definitely like to focus on in the future. Our our Russian, Arabic, and Ukrainian beginners' guides have an, a website accompanying them, and. It's great for students and teachers. Um, we find they're very popular. And next year, we're publishing Romanian, uh, Beginner's Romanian, with that kind of website as well. With the, just those extra exercises, videos, audio content, all that kind of thing that you can put on, is it seems to be key for learners. Um, so yeah, just to give you a sense, you can see behind me some of our um, publications. But um, w one of the areas I want to grow in um, are the African languages. There are not a lot of products available in those. We're publishing an Asante Twi dictionary by the end of the year. Next year, we'll publish a Dinka dictionary, which is a language. Uh, Twi is spoken in um, Ghana, uh, and Dinka is spoken in South Sudan. And um, some other things coming up next year, a beginner's Bengali, a Khmer practical. We've had huge uh, requests for those. And our first uh, trilingual dictionary, which will be Quechua to Spanish to English. So look for those. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks.
Hello. Usually I, I drink a, a glass of whiskey of Côte du Rhône to feel at ease when I, I speak a different language. So I'm French and I'm speaking to the caption girl. If I make some mistakes, you can fix it on the screen, please. <laughs> um, first of all, and since it's the first time I'm speaking in English uh, in front of such a um, uh, large and uh, prestigious audience, I'd like to dedicate my presentation to Donald Trump for his um, <laughs> unforgettable contribution to monolingualism in this country. Um, second, yes. you can tweet that if you want. Uh, second, I'd like to thank the, the Polyglot Conference for the in invitation for having us on, on board, and especially Ellen, who did uh, such a, a, an incredible job uh, to make this event a success. Once upon a time in France, at the end of the 20s, there was a man called Alphonse Chérel. He was a polyglot and a traveler, like many of you are. He learned many languages like English, German, Russian, Italian. In Milan, he was nicknamed Alfonso il Poliglota. I want to read you an Alphonse Chérel quote from 1933. I love to discover a country, to understand its culture, to hear the sounds of the language. I'm not a linguist in the Latin sense of the word, but a curious man moved by the passion of international exchanges. He has invented the principle of intuitive assimilation in self-learning. Mainly it consists in a method based on 100 lessons with a progress, progressive um, uh, way of learning. It tries to imitate the natural process through which you learn your own language. It's been a big success since the very beginning, and 86 years later, it's still an independent uh, company with a catalog of, let's say, 80 target languages available for some of, of them in 12 source languages. Why are we still here 86 years later? Because the method is very efficient, I guess. And according to me, it has this unique blend of poetic and witty dialogues which which penetrates your brain and makes the language easier to learn. Our most polyglot is actor Kirk Douglas, who learned French with Asimil in the 50s. Um, it will be 99 in December. So I wanted just to make uh, um, a sign to, to Kirk. He tells this in his memories. Now, I'd like to take a big leap forward to show you some recent covers and new offerings. I need to know that I think language learning covers in publishing are quite boring. Um, so I'm trying to change this a little bit. This is um, a cover design especially for our special 85th anniversary last year. Uh, it was designed by Noma Bar, and it's a way of playing with cliché, of course. Uh, I think it's different to avoid clichés when you are publishing a book. I don't know whether you, you agree with me, but maybe you can play with cliche, and that's I love to do. So now I guess I need to click on this. Yeah, This is the new um, design for our At Ease series. And um, well, we wanted to focus on the cultural and natural heritage that the language carries uh, implicitly. I also wanted to avoid showing people on the art covers as uh, we did before. These are our uh, ancient languages uh, covers. Um, you can see the Latin, and if you're wondering whether the Romans were uh, reading on the loo, you have the, the answer now. Um, <laughs> at the bottom, you have uh, the girlfriend of William Jones, um, Miss, Miss India 80, and of course, um, ancient Egyptian and also ancient Greek on the top. Sorry for the noise. Another series we have is a new one, um, which are uh, work, workbooks. We notice that there is a demand for uh, practicing writing uh, systems, but also to practice language in a more general way. So 
with these covers. And I think it's both funny and nice because um, signs are uh, treated like uh, images and images are treated like signs. That's the whole idea of, of it. And of course it plays with cliches in a funny way as well. And at last, a few examples of our uh, Facebook covers. I'm sorry for Volkswagen um, <laughs> here. Um, but we did this two years ago. Now, another big leap, not forward this time, but on the side. Uh, I want to tell you about the popular language of to today and tomorrow. Of course, it's difficult to predict what the future popular uh, language uh, or languages will be in a given uh, community of speakers. Forecast is maybe easier. Predicting is about magic, paranormal intuition, and forecast is all about marketing and an analytics. I hope you see the nuance between the two. Uh, Language-wise, I think it's important to see the world through a telescope, but it's also important to watch your surroundings with a mic microscope. I'm trying to say that global is important, but local can be great too. There will be more micro phenomena related to economics and geopolitics. Let me give you uh, one single example of that. In 2012, we published a Luxembourgish Facebook. We sold more than 20,000 copies in three years, which was quite a mystery to me, but I tried to understand this and um, I just noticed that 70,000 French people were crossing the border to go to Luxembourg, to the Grand Duchy, to work. And German and French was not, were not enough for them. So they needed a Luxembourgish uh, tool to learn the language. So we decided to um, publish another course uh, last year, which is a big success as well. Um, Luxembourg is not only the place where the big um, companies um, choose to, to stand. It's, only, it's also a place, um, a lab in a way, because it's the uh, most um, uh, multilingual country in Europe. 67% of the people are uh, speaking more than three languages. So it's an interesting um, uh, point to see how uh, a local problem can be a, a real success in publishing. Um, anyway, I think English should be less and less important in France now because uh, the French uh, people are more and more exposed to English and uh, yeah, their, their competence with English is it's quite good. So I don't think English will be as strong as it will be um, in the future. So. This means that if you consider languages as tools, um, one part of the publisher job is to um, build some interesting tools um, to use those tools, I mean manuals or so. Thanks for your, atten your attention. Thank you for your fantabulous talks. Um, yes, fantabulous. That's a new word. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous and fantastic. You, you mix that up and you can do like Tim. It's just new, evolving. Uh, my question is that um, in a crowd like this, I think when you say the market for learning a new languages is, is huge. There's, that's a no-brainer. Um, but people like me, um, I, I speak a few languages not because I'm a gifted learner. I mean, by no means compared to the Bennies and the uh, Richards, I, I, I just can't. But thanks to my parents, who raised me in a great environment uh, and taught me to learn languages when I was a kid, I can do it today. And I've written books about that, and I'm doing the same things for my kids, and I want to write books about that. Is there a market for that? That's, that's really my question. What's that compared to? language learning books. The market for parents who want to raise multilingual children, um, what was, how is that looking like, and what's the evolution? Uh, any ideas? 
that's, that's a nice question, uh, don't you think? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I think it's true. We, we need to prepare um, uh, language learners of uh, tomorrow, really. And um, we have a few projects at SEMIL, and I guess my colleagues have also, um, to uh, build this kind of uh, chain between the learners, you see, between the generations of learners. Uh, Asimil is 86 years old. This means that we have a, a big uh, reservoir of people who learn languages with Asimil, and maybe they want to offer an Asimil course for their uh, grandson or, or their nephew, I don't know. So it's a very good question. I think we, we need to, to bring some uh, children products on the market. I think, um, yes, there are, there are several books out there already about how to raise bilingual children or multilingual children. Um, it's not something that we focus on specifically. But one of the things that we do find that people are interested in is what's called heritage learners. Um, so for example, in the UK, there are a lot of people who came over or do, but they haven't learned it formally. Um, so I think that a lot of parents are trying to educate their children in those languages as well. Um, and that's a very important aspect of learning. And then also, just recently, I mean, in the New York City public school system, there's a lot more bilingual programs because I think that parents are concerned about this and recognize that English just isn't enough. So obviously, that's changing in terms of curriculum and things like that. But on the other hand, in the UK, um, you know, at the higher levels, they're actually stopping uh, GCSEs, so high level exams. But again, in 2014, um, foreign language learning was um, mandatory in, in primary schools. So there is this move in general towards educating um, young children. And I think there will be more and more books out there on that topic. I mean, I think, just to speak to that briefly, we published a series of children's dictionaries, um, picture dictionaries, which is 500 words. And we tried to back, it started in the late 90s, 2000, and we tried to do some lesser known languages. Like, it's not as easy to find a children's dictionary in Swedish or Polish. Um, you know, typically children are taught French or, or Spanish, things like that. Um, and some of them did last for a while. Um, we did do an Arabic one back then um, before it was very popular. But um, I think there are a lot of um, like Saturday schools and programs for children who want, you know, their parents send them on that day to, to get more background in that language, more than they can get it in home or at their school programs. So some of our books have been useful in that way too. I think there are a lot of Korean language learners who are, um, doing Saturday schools and like we have a book for learning Korean script things like that but um, it's probably yeah it's probably something to focus on in the future like you've mentioned um, <laughs> time to roll out more children's dictionaries <laughs> in the I, I, I think it's a really interesting question I was actually brought up bilingual my parents are Spanish and I'm so grateful now at the time I didn't want to know I wanted to just be like my friends, but my parents were so persistent in talking Spanish to me, and so now I'm bilingual, and I'm so grateful for that. And I think it's an important point that there should be more resources for, for the parents, because they play such an important role in, I mean, it's such a globalized world now, people are moving around, so there's so many people who, ha who are from one culture, one, one language, who have moved somewhere else, and their children are growing up in a different culture, and they can benefit from having both access to both if, if the parents you know, have the tools and resources to, to, to promote that. I mean, we published a book called Growing Up With Two Languages, and that's probably something worth looking into. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's definitely scope for more heritage language resources, because obviously children who are growing up at, with heritage languages obvi obviously have different needs as well. So they, if they're going to start a book, uh, learning the language at school, they might not find it so interesting because they're at a different level, they've got different needs. So there's definitely room for, for more books that are specifically aimed at, at those sorts of learners. And, and yes, yeah, supporting the parents to really persevere and, and encourage them in the early years. Yeah. Hi, I'm a huge fan of all of your companies and collect a lot of your <laughs> books. Um, I'm very much a digital person, but I also am pretty old fashioned with a, with a lot of the books that I like. I was wondering if there was any plan to um, like reprint some of the older manuals, particularly Aussie Meal, that are really high quality, but then maybe update some of the outdated content, but still keep the methodology? Well, never say never. <laughs> the Latin is uh, actually um, a reprint of the 1996 
addition with additions and uh, some new audio stuff. So, well, I don't know is it, there is a demand, why not? Um, but uh, um, I do believe in, in books. I mean, books are uh, something perfect. It's difficult to um, go over a book. I mean, um, when you're learning, um, synoptic things are very important. And for the moment, digital experience is different than that, than that I guess. So um, e-books in France are not so important now. Mm. But because um, we have 10,000 places to buy books in France uh, because of the netbook agreement. So it's pretty different than the UK or the US market. Um, so. Uh, I just wanted to add to that, given the success of our original colloquial Chinese, maybe we need to bring back some of the original colloquials that are very grammar based, um, very old fashioned, and, and yeah, methodology has changed quite a lot over the years, but some people out there still like that traditional approach. I know I'm one of the, those people. Uh, yeah, Rosa and Yoruba and Esperanto, actually yeah, I've been thinking about bringing those back as well. Um, and we're revisiting a lot of our ancient languages um, and, and building out that, which I think many of you publish in as well. Um, one of the things that also we're trying to do with the Teach Yourself Languages Online is we're trying to kind of take that book content and put it online, obviously digitize it. But it's, it's the same um, syllabus. So the idea is that you have flexibility because I do believe that people want a book but we know that just reading or doing an activity once really doesn't help with language learning. So being able to then do that same learning practice, that same vocabulary, grammar online, and integrate these two, we think that that's really where people want to be. It's not one or the other, it's both. Hmm. So hopefully we'll put um, some of these rarer languages up there too eventually. I think we've seen um, multiple editions, like second edition, third edition, fourth edition, you know, where the authors come back and are able to make revisions, enhancements, things like that to the products. Um, but that said, um, when there isn't a huge market and we can't sell even 2,000 copies of a book, we've found a solution through print on demand. So some of the old dictionaries where um, we're seeing you know, a few hundred copies s selling a year, we are putting in our print-on-demand program, so at least it's out there and available if somebody wants it. You know? yeah. This is perhaps a follow-up to print-on-demand. Um, I've used products from all of your companies, but I especially want to thank, thank Routledge for publishing books that you can take a European language to the next level with. And that's something that seems to me is missing with the other publishers, that if you've, you learn Dutch or Swedish or Finnish or Greek, there's only a beginner's level. There, there, there is advanced stuff in French, German, Italian, and Spanish, and Portuguese, and Russian, but those other languages, you're stuck once you, you've completed the first book. Um, I, I'll just add that I agree. Um, <laughs> uh, from a publishing perspective, since that's mm. what, we're, what we're talking about, there's a market out there that we have to obviously react to. The biggest market is the beginner learner, and that's where we sell the most product. So it's actually difficult, again, when you're only selling 500, 1,000 copies, something like that. But that said, we actually are starting to um, publish in, in more languages in our intermediate to advanced level. Um, and we're adding Norwegian and Swedish and less popular, um, you know, not your, your regular French, Italian, German, and Spanish courses. So, we're attempting to do that. And we are continuing to publish in those advanced <laughs> levels, <laughs> broadening out. Um, yeah. But it, it's, a, it's a fair point that it is harder to publish in those areas, that there is less demand. But with print on demand, it does make it easier. And also making mm -hmm. sure the content that we're publishing, so say, you know, um, a comprehensive grammar in a certain language, that, that content will last for a long time. So we can take the long view and say, okay, mm -hmm. we may only sell a couple of hundred copies a year, but this will be a resource that people can use for many years and it'll be print on demand so so we can we can do that we can provide those resources sorry we have a um, system of questions we've got some people who've queued up actually um, so 
do you guys also want to answer this comment about the advanced languages? Well, uh, we, have a, we have a couple of um, intermediate guides as well in, in the more popular languages, though, like Arabic mm. and Chinese. Um, so it's harder to, it is harder to sell it in the lesser known, lesser selling languages. <laughs> yeah, you lose maybe 50% or so yeah. of, of the figure <coughs> in sales mm. for this kind of book. So, I mean, the bookshops, they don't want really to yeah. have it. Mm. See what I mean? I think. Again, digital will help with this, where we can potentially publish either print on demand or write to an ebook or another format and get around that. Hi. <laughs> so my name is uh, oh wow, well, uh, my name is Katie or oh, Hadi, if you can uh, if you can pronounce it in uh, Arabic, and I'm really concerned about African languages. So I'm having a talk tomorrow about African languages and web content. So I have two questions about it. So what is about the demand regarding African languages in the Western world? And the second one is like, do you sell in Africa? And if yes, because 50% uh, of the population in Africa are having like mobile device, are you saying like mostly books or e-books? Hmm. Um, well, we, when we've tried to find co-publishers in Africa for some of our titles because a distribution is just easier when someone's on the ground there with their um, system in place. Um, we, we did that with the Creo, so our um, author was able to find a publisher in Sierra Leone and distribute the book there. I mean, distribution is tough in uh, some places, especially when it's non-traditional, too, when it's not necessarily in a bookstore, but it's sold through other outlets um, that we just don't have access to from here. Uh, and we've, we've, we've tried to work with publishers there. So you know, we, we also work with European and uh, South American and so forth publishers where we're doing the uh, North American edition. So we sell in US and Canada um, their book, which they're distributing in other places. So that's, that would be my best strategy for African languages, is finding publishers there to um, distribute our books. Hi. Um, my name is Victor. I, I have a few comments, too. Just a little background. Um, my whole background is in linguistics. I have a BA in linguistics, master's degree in computational linguistics, finishing my PhD in applied linguistics. I've worked for over five different language companies and language testing companies in the United States and abroad. So I'm very familiar with the whole industry. Um, one thing that I would like to say I'm a little disappointed is the level of discussions that we're having here. I thought we would go way deeper into language learning itself. What makes a good language learning method? Um, if my voice is shaking a little, it's because I'm very emotional about this topic. And I think there's two different markets out there. There's people who want to learn language at home, and they want it to be fun. They're willing to spend money on it, even if after three years of learning a language, they're only going to be at an A1 level still because the methodology isn't good enough. And then you have people like us, real polyglots, that sometimes we don't care so much if it's fun. Just give us something that works. And this is really where I congratulate my personal opinion, but talking to a lot of polyglots, what is the number one method that you go to if you're going to start learning a first language? Just shout it out. First method. Say it. I, I don't hear, but I'm Asimil is sense. the number one book that I hear a lot of people saying, okay. that's the one I'm going to start using. Extremely old method. Which one? I'm not sure. Old. Um, no, no. <laughs> it's a but method that has been around anyway. for a very long time, but it seems to have something that a lot of others are missing. Methodology. Duolingo, one of the giants out there, they hired the first person who knew anything about language learning about six months ago. I know the CEO of Duolingo. I know what's going on in there. You guys have a B2 reference. I congratulate you for that. What about the other companies? OK, let's let you guys comment on that. Um, <laughs> OK, I can, I, I can leave now. I, <laughs> my background is also in, in linguistics, so I completely agree with you. I will say that this is that was not what we were asked to talk about um, for this particular panel discussion. But um, I think methodology is at the core of everything. And um, I think, again, that's what the publisher is good at. It is working with academics, staying on top of methodology. My personal opinion, um, 
I think there are a lot of things that work, um, and it depends on the person and what they want. I think audio methods such as Pimsleur, Michelle Thomas, are brilliant at getting people to speak from the start and things like that. Um, I actually also publish Michelle Thomas, so I can speak more about that methodology. In terms of what we're doing, Teach Yourself, um, we've actually started a revision program for absolutely every language we publish. Um, and that started in 2012 because we actually found that there was an inconsistency. Um, authors came to the process very differently, had different backgrounds. So we're trying to impose good methodologies. And the one thing that we're doing um, primarily is focusing on more inductive learning um, to get people to start noticing patterns for themselves. This is important, especially for the self-learner who doesn't have a teacher there to point things out to them. So we call it the discovery method um, because that's a bit more sexier than inductive learning. Um, but I think you know, you're absolutely right. It's, it's incredibly important. And I purposely didn't comment on the content that's out there online in apps, Busu, Babel, um, because I don't think that's what I'm here to do. But I will say that as a publisher, content and quality absolutely should and does come first. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, just speaking to that question as well, I'm not sure there is, obviously the quality, and the, con the quality of the content is, is very important, but I'm not sure there is necessarily one, one method that is going to work for everyone. Um, so there are different types of language learners who, who need different approaches, and even a single language learner will go to different approaches. So you might start off in the beginning with, with something like Duolingo, and then as you progress, you might want something that's more traditional, a grammar. So we try to publish a range of different products that take different approaches. And so there is there, there are options there for you as learners. And I think the languages themselves um, probably lend themselves to different methodologies. Um, mm. It might be better to learn uh, Mandarin one way and Portuguese another way. You know, um, that, so our authors individually sort of uh, approach it through what the, what they've used teaching, what they've used um, in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. But but we appreciate your passion. <laughs> Certainly, I mean it's people like you that we are working for. So. Yeah. Hi. First of all, thanks for coming and sharing all of this with us. Um, I've been told the last question, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, I'm a language blogger, and I have a Spanish section that's growing very, very slowly due to, to the lack of products that are locally available, particularly in Mexico, where I'm from, but I will use uh, the term Latin America very broadly. Um, I would like to know if there are plans to expand your op uh, individual operations into Latin America, because, for example, I am bilingual, and I don't mind learning from um, resources in English but that's not the case for the rest of Latin America. So um, if you're not intending uh, to do it, would you please consider it? <laughs> well, I, I mentioned one product we're doing next year, which we um, Quechua to Spanish to English. Um, it's our first trilingual dictionary. So possibly based on the <laughs> success of that, it might be something we could move into in the future as well. But I think you know, primarily we're working from English to foreign language resources. That's just our market. You know, I think there might be publishers locally that would do do something different um, in the local language. We um, are working with uh, a new distributor, actually, to, to grow in Spain. But because we do publish in English um, to foreign languages, it's actually on the other end where people aren't as interested in our products. So what we do is we um, sell foreign translation rights. And so again, I think it's uh, to find a local publisher in Mexico who can take our books with you know, the content there and translate it. That would be the same for us, yeah. 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 Thank you so much to our publishers for this wonderful <laughs> talk. Thank you. Thank you.